Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Achtung, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, the Second World War podcast for all your Second World War podcast needs. WW2Pod, We Have Ways of Making You Talk, in fact. Um, James, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. And, um, you know, the, the name change. I'm We've been banging the drum for the SWW for a long time, so now we're having to <laughs> slightly eat our words. But, you know, and it is interesting because the Italians call it the Second World War, um, yeah. The French call it the Second World War. The Germans call it the Second World War. Everyone calls it the Second World War, apart from the Americans. Yeah. But as we know, American culture and <laughs> American way of saying things does rather dominate. And uh, a shorthand is, there's no doubt about it, that WW2. Well, WW2 and we live is a in a shorthand. world of shorthands, don't we? Yes, yes. SWW, would, I think, would have a lot of people scratching their heads immediately <laughs> rather than instantly seeing what it is anyway um we, or, we, or we, gsr uh, no what uh, secondo no guerra secondo mondiale yeah yeah yeah, it's, it's, it's not <laughs> yeah there. forget it um or great patriotic war or um uh the second 30 years war i mean we, we could cook we could we could go for that if yeah you wanted. <laughs> right so um and what we thought we'd do um answer some questions so kyle glover so he asks the ministry of ungentlemanly warfare are you looking forward to the film? Looking forward to it yeah, or 100%. not? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I can't wait. Yeah. I love Guy Ritchie movies, yeah. and um, I'm really, really looking forward to this. I, I mean, I think you have to go into into a, into a movie like that yeah. with exactly the right frame of mind, which is you're just going to be entertained for an hour and a half. Yeah, uh, um, and, and it's going to have some people dressed in Second World War costumes, and it's going to have some Second yeah. World War um, weapons. Yeah, and that's about it. In terms of historical accuracy, <laughs> there's going to be a because I do have to know it's a raid in, in in West Africa and there's lots of German stuff, which yeah. obviously there wasn't, yeah. Um, yeah. and and <laughs> you know the whole the whole cast of of kind of badasses doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And, yeah, yeah, you know, but everything about it is historically wrong. But who cares? But the tagline is, if Hitler isn't playing by the rules, then neither shall we. If it's ungentlemanly warfare, it's someone say, if Hitler isn't playing by the rules, then why should we? Exactly. Well, no, I think I think um, Henry Cavill is, is very much taking that um, that kind of accent, that, that approach. I mean, I've seen the trailer and stuff. I mean, it looks great. I love Henry Cavill anyway. I mean, he's great. He should be Bond. The thing is, is there, is there uh, you know, the, the, the questions of ungentlemanly warfare. I mean, this is about SOE, isn't it? But there's a, there's also the sort of Churchill's toy shop and all this sort of, you know, all these people between the cracks that um, attract stories. So it's, it's a little surprises a, a movie called this. Yes. Yeah, so and also, let, let's 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 not beat about the bush. I mean, the Guns of Navarone isn't exactly historically <laughs> accurate. <laughs> Or the Sea Wolves, or you know any of these films. I mean, it's a, it's a movie. I mean, who cares? I mean, I, I am really really looking forward to it because I'm a big Guy Ritchie fan. I I love his stuff. I think he's. I, I thought the Man from Uncle was utterly brilliant, and I know it got a bit panned at the time, but I thought it was just completely tremendous. It was very stylish, wasn't it? Yeah. Very stylish, and you know that's what I want from a movie. Also, the other thing I like about it is, is <laughs> and he makes films that last about an hour and forty minutes, which is about right. I think. <laughs> You know, I, I, don't, I don't go with these kind of three and a half hour epic sort of auteur things. It always seems self-indulgent to me. So, uh, let's go to Simon's question. If the US bombers are continue to experience the losses of late 42, early 43, longer term, um, well, I mean, due to or even into late 43, you could argue, due to no fight, escort yeah. fighters, do you think they would have been forced into changing to night bombing or they would have stuck to their guns to save face? I mean, they do try night bombing, don't they? They do. They do. Um, uh, in mid forty three, don't they? They do send some people out on night sorties with the with the RAF, don't they? I think that's a really, really interesting question. It is, isn't it? Um, no, I think they'd have, they, they would have come up with a solution. They, they, there they is would a lot have, of face. They would have. They would have got Spitfires, or they'd have had more P thirty eights. They ju they just would have come up with a solution. They, you know, the idea that the, say there's no P fifty one ever. I mean, the, the point about the P fifty one is it's the most efficient aircraft that you can put long range tanks on because yeah. of its fuel efficiency. But it's not like there aren't other planes that you could do that to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah so yeah. you would just do that, and you would adjust accordingly. And it would take um, longer. 
to to break the Luftwaffe. I mean, I mean, don't forget the whole kind of build up of forces in in Italy, for example. That is all about what do we do if we don't have yeah, yeah, yeah. enough long range fighters to get us into the Reich. I mean, that's what yeah. that's all about. That the the increase of six bomb groups to the Fodger Airfield complex yeah. to twenty one is all about yeah. that. I think they just would have found a solution. I, I I can't see any circumstances in which they would have had a vault fast and changed a night bombing. I think he's absolutely right. The, the expression save face is right in this, Simon. It, it, there was a lot of face in this involved, an awful lot of, because a big big part of this is about about proving the efficacy of, of an air force that's not part of the army, isn't it? That what you need is an air force that isn't part of the army. And, and the lobby that has got this far with day, daytime precision bombing is that lobby, isn't it? So they're they're... You know, they're, they're hardly going it, to, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to back down. And also, they've had so much, they've spent so much money on this. You know, I mean, it's like when the B-29 comes along, the B-29, you know, they, they commit to building it before it's flown. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's the most extraordinary project. James Scott's book, so much of that book, you, you can read the tone. I read that very much as there are an awful lot of people who, there is determined to be right as to win the war, as they were to win the war. That being proved right was a cornerstone of, of how a lot of them were going about it. And, and that, that mattered as much as defeating Japan, which I think yes. is kind of amazing, really. You know, the, 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 yeah. the, the power of ideolo- ideology and the power of people with an ideology, you know, once they're given, once they're given their head, you know, all of, after all, all of this is blank page thinking, all of it, blank page thinking, blank page theorizing, blank page science. But, you know, the... the, the there, there's no such thing as strategic bombing in 1939. There's no, really no such thing as strategic bombing in 1940 either, even though the RAF are trying it. It doesn't exist. And so for no, the they Americans... They don't really know how that manifests itself, do they? No, no, no. They've talked about it a lot. RAF have talked about it an awful lot. And, and again, so much of it is that what you've got is, in the UK, you've got sort of riding the rapids of disarmament and technological change and ideas about technology. You know, so they're trying to negotiate that slalom. And in America, it's that, you know, what what do you even need? You know, isolationist America, what do you even need an Air Force for? Protecting your coast. I mean, so strategic bombing couldn't couldn't be any further off the shopping list. And yet these people end up in charge. So by the time, I think, think, you know, so much of it is about saving face. I think it's it's absolutely fascinating. And then by the time you get to Japan, where you've built the B-29 that's meant to be a stratospheric bomber, and then you're using it at low level to bomb Tokyo at night, it's as if if none of these arguments amount to anything. It's very weird. That, the, the Tokyo raid, for the fact that they use those use the B-29s at low level, having spent all that money on designing a bomber that's meant to be, you know, that's pressurised, that you can fly as high as possible. Yeah, I kind of – don't, don't forget, the guy who's who's running that is Curtis LeMay, who has I know, been commander of the 3rd Division in, in, in with the 8th Air Force in Britain. And so he's had lots and lots of interaction with Bomber Command as well as his – Peers yeah. and, and you know compadres in in yeah. a fair force. Well, he's no theorist, and and the, yeah, but the but the but the reason is why it? they're stubbornly sticking to this is because they've gone. We don't want to be doing what the RAF bomber command are doing. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not night bombing per se. I don't think. I mean, it was to start off with, but as time goes on, that's not the issue. The issue is. We want to be doing our own thing. We want to be doing this. And there is an advantage yeah. for doing round-the-clock bombing. And there is also self-evidently a massive advantage on, on Operation Point Blank, which for those yeah. who you can't remember who haven't heard any of the early episodes, is is a, a directive that comes out in June 1943, which prioritizes destruction of the German aircraft industry and the Luftwaffe over any other target. That's what daylight precision bombing is all about. It's all about Operation Point Blank. Yeah. Whereas in the Pacific... The U.S. Army Air Force, on their own, they haven't got the RAF Bomber Command to worry about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, They haven't got kind of the boffins in Whitehall breathing down their necks. You know, they can do their own thing, and so you can change it and you can adapt. And I think yeah. actually having having you know operational flexibility is is really important. I I I know you're really struck with this concept of of everyone's following, you know, everyone's an ideologue in the Second World War at the highest yeah. level. And I think that's incredibly convincing, actually. And 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 the more I've thought about it since you first mentioned it, the more I kind of agree with you, because clearly there is some major ideology going on here, which yeah. is particularly in the bomber war, which is developed from the kind of bomber mafia of the 1930s, yep. so-called, into... Okay, this isn't going quite as planned, but we're going to stick to it in in the case of European war. Through to okay, what does what does the future look like? The United States Army Air Force is absolutely the cutting edge of new technology, new inventions, 
yeah. new defense projects, you know, from the atomic bomb, which is obviously going to have to be delivered by the United States Army Air Force, through to jet technology, through to yeah. the B-29s, et cetera, et cetera. What is interesting about the Second World War is is, is although bombing and, and air, for, air power doesn't deliver victory in itself, it remains, and, and that was always the kind of the panacea that they, the, yeah. the, the bomber men and the and the are you know and the, and the airmen believed in. When the war is over, even more so is it going. The future going to be dictated yeah. by air power. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And, and yeah. the B twenty nine is is the is the answer to that. So are all the flattened cities of Germany. So is yeah. the atomic bomb. You know yeah. that is the future. And and also what else is also the future is 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 jet technology. And in that, obviously, you know, Britain has the briefly has the has the lead in the post war years. And it's interesting that for Britain post nineteen forty five, research and development and and future defence is all about air power. It's not about yeah. navy. It's not about the army. It's all about air power. It is developing yeah. jet technology. And then it's well, about developing commercial air power as well as military air power. And, and that's how you rebuild Britain, you know, economically, as well as yeah. rebuilding Britain's defences. I mean, it's amazing. It's all about air power. The similar current that, that, that um, downplays the effect of bombing, the efficacy of bombing, at the same time as amping up its cruelty, demanding that the moral questions be asked. asked. Do you think that's a cold, a cold War response to the threat of nuclear war? That basically there's a kind of, you know, blowback, which is, look, bombing, the bombing, bombing didn't work. It didn't win the war. It didn't succeed. And look at the destruction. As a kind of, in the tone of, Nuclear, you know, the, the idea that nu- nuclear war won't work is pointless, is and is wanted, you know, wantedly cruel or something. You, you know what I mean? That that's part of the mix, because because you know, bom- bomber commander, what they, as well as being sort of shoved aside politically by Churchill, basically as the wars as the wars ending, you know, bom- bomber command is not a respectable thing for, for the decades that follow the Second World War, is it? And even to the point, the RAF, the RAF. Calls it calls itself Strike Command, changes its name, you know, like they, they rebrand, yeah, because because the branding yeah, yeah, yeah. the branding's no good, you know. And I think, yeah, I, I kind of I, I think there was deep disquiet and and discomfort about bombing right from the word go. Actually, yeah, I, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't think I think flattening cities sits, sits very uncomfortably with people, and it's all very yes. well going. Yeah, but look at Coventry. The answer to that is yeah, look at Coventry. Yeah, 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 you, yeah. you know, you know, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. And yet, isn't it interesting that that Every time there's a major conflict, a major conflict rather than a kind of insurrection. Every time there's a major conflict, what happens? Cities get and towns and things get get flattened. Look at Gaza. Look at Ukraine. I Syria. Mean, you know. Look at Syria. Look at Syria. It's absolutely. Um, look at all these places. You, you know, they're still getting flattened. And I think there is. I, I my my sense is that that. Flattening cities has never gone away, and, and I think if there was another war, I think air power would absolutely have a major role again, and more cities would get flattened. It's, it's yeah. Amazing, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, if, yeah. if it escalated out of Ukraine, for example, I, I think it's all very well being holier than thou and going, "Oh, you know, we don't like it; it's horrible." But I can promise you, the moment there was a conventional war, that is exactly what would happen. Yeah, you know, because because well, the, the point is, you're not you're you're supposed to protect civilian life and avoid it. But but how do you avoid it if your military target is right in the middle of Bristol? Or, yeah. Berlin well, and or... yeah, fired all your cruise missiles off in the first fortnight. Now what? Right. I, I, I mean, you know, I still, I still think air power has a has a long way to go. Is my is my my hunch. Well, there we go. But saving face, I think, is is the is a big part of it. The, the you know, it, it's little wonder that it's a war of ideologies, though, because after all, there's there's not been one like it. Ranges of aircraft mean that the aircraft will change the battlefield forever in the Second World War in a way it couldn't in the First World War. That and missiles, obviously, because that's the other thing is this. You know, in the end, the British abandoned the jet. UK abandons its place in the jet race and buys some Polaris missiles, doesn't it? Sticks them under an ice cap, you know. Um, Right. Okay. Uh, Mark Richmond says, was there any pro-Axis group on Malta that would have supported an Italian-German invasion? Uh, Well, there was to start off with, and they were all kicked off the island and and sent off to (laughs) wherever they were sent. I can't remember where they were packed off to, but loads of them were kind of put in prison or kind of, you know, so um, Uganda deported. or somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Was it was really? I think it was like Uganda. Yeah, I think it absolutely was something like that. Um, then there was a there was a spy called Camelo Borg Pisani who who was a young guy who who made a complete hash of it. He was an Axis spy. He he he, he came over by boat. His boat got wrecked or something off the Dingley Cliffs. I can't quite remember. But anyway, he came ashore, got caught within about a minute, um, and yeah. was hanged in November nineteen forty two. There wasn't a lot, but 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 you know what it was was was. Clamped down very, very hard. You know, there were pro-Italian 
um, particularly in the 1930s. You know, I mean, it's a very, it's a very, Malta's a very, very odd marriage between between the British ever since sort of 1800 when when Nelson took it over. Um, came in after the Battle of the Nile. Yeah. Through to, I think it was 1814, if I remember rightly, um, was when it formally became a, a British protectorate. And, you know, it was it was British in the same way that Gibraltar, all the Falkland Islands are British. Yeah. You know, it's British pounds, all the rest of it. And and there was kind of no representation in the House of Commons or anything like that. But, but, but yeah. you know, it, it, it was British. It had been since the early 19th century. So those ties ran very deep. But on the face of it, it shouldn't have really worked because obviously Britain is Northern European and Protestant and, and Malta is one of the most Catholic places in the whole of Europe. But it kind of sort of did. You know, everyone yeah. kind of sort of rubbed along and, and you know, everyone, most Maltese people recognise the kind of sort of mutual benefits of being part of a, you know, the massive machine that was the British Empire. And, and you know, and, and obviously the Royal Navy, the Mediterranean fleet had its base there. And, and that was the kind of absolute kind of basis on which, you know, the relationship really, really worked. You know, there was yeah. lots of employment for the, in the docks of, of, of stevedores and shipbuilders yeah. and ship repair workshops and all the rest of it and indeed the navy and merchant navy uh, and britain so in turn kind of brought in lots of money yeah money jobs and also keeps the sicilians off your back too you could it sort of guarantees yeah, all of that a, a, a peculiar kind of autonomy paradoxical sort of autonomy isn't it is that malta gets to be malta within the with under the protection of the royal navy in a way that it wouldn't if the royal navy weren't there you know it, would, it might end up being a sicilian outpost if you can be rich and and you know or, or comparatively well off and and economic sound and democratic and have all your freedoms why would you want to be a fascist yeah. under a fascist dictatorship i mean the whole point about the fascist dictatorship is because democracy is broken and you know we're impoverished and and the country isn't working so let's get a strong man in to kind of sort of fix all this stuff yeah that's the whole point of mussolini in 1922 but if you don't have that problem then you don't need the strong man dictator do you yeah exactly so from from a from a maltese point of view one earth would you want you know, fascist Italy, I'm telling you what It's interesting, though, that the British don't scoop up all the other, that, that Pantelleria isn't also a, you know what I mean? That all the islands aren't yeah. scooped up in that part of the world. Yeah. Clearly the, no, the Navy thought Malta was sufficient. Well, it's just that, you know, those two harbours, Marsmachet and Grand Harbour, you know, they're so deep. Yeah. And, and, you know, for all your naval needs, you've just got the one. I mean, don't, don't forget also, that, you know, these places don't come about cost. I mean, you know, ultimately why empires always collapse, generally speaking, is because the cost of them outweighs the benefits. So, um, I mean, the thing is, is there are pro-axis groups absolutely everywhere, all over the world, before the war, and some of them yep. some of them then evaporate. In the, I mean, there, you know, you read about so many people in this country who are basically, um, uh, the minute the war comes, they, 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 they go to, you know they're called to their colours and they do their duty, but right up to that point, there there's a whole load of people who think that the yeah. Nazis are you know look like they're doing a yeah. good job in a difficult place and all that sort of thing. You know, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or, or bring a bit of order, discipline. Out. And whose yeah. business is Germany? You know, it's not our business. What's happening in Germany anyway? Which is, I think, the, a huge factor actually. Um, uh, uh, people of a long, you know, people far off place about whom we know very little, and, all, and all that. Yeah, which I think I always, yeah. I would always admire Chamberlain's brass neck when he says that. Given the British Empire, people in the foreign, you know, <laughs> India. Yeah, but all he's mate. doing is he's reflecting ninety-two percent of the population. I know, I know, which is kind of amazing, really. Like, given the British Empire, you know, like we, we're, yeah. we're we're one great big business that's involved with far-off places of which we know little. Anyway, I, 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 I digress. Yeah, but I mean, but it is interesting in in you know in the autumn of nineteen thirty-eight, the height of the of the Munich crisis. Yeah, you know, Chamberlain's widely seen as a great success and a huge hero for kind of preventing yeah, war yeah. and for for. Sort, yeah. Sorting it out. I mean, yeah. you, you know, it's a brave prime minister that goes against the wishes of over ninety percent of the population. Yes, he's done the right thing um, for the for the moment, and I think whilst at the same time rearming and strengthening the navy but, and but the within his, I mean, but also within way. his range of political options. What are his actual political options at this point? Yeah, I mean, cool. what, 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 that's what, my what, point. What, but what really are they? You know, and after all, politicians can only generally only act within their options, or, or you know, they then have to be lucky, don't they? Is the is the thing? Well, yes, but what you do need to do is you also need to you do need to um, you need to make sure that you that you're preparing in multiple different ways for yeah. an eventuality that might still occur. Um, whether that be building up your armed forces, or or whether that be sort of changing the narrative in the media, and he's doing that. 
He's doing that, which he, in a which fort, he is you know, doing. Fortress Britain is the is the the way he's looking yeah. at it, isn't he? Yeah. Rather than yeah. necessarily, in a, you know, a, the kind of offensive war the British end up having to fight. Um, uh, yeah. The idea is that he's going to put the he's going to put the shutters up and no one's going to get in. Yes, but I mean there are pro axis people in every absolutely everywhere in every walk of life, right up until the minute they um, there aren't. <laughs> anyway, we need to take a quick break and then we'll be back with some more questions. You don't have to buy custom window treatments in person because Blinds.com invented a better way. Blinds.com is 100% online. There's no showroom markups or waiting hours for quotes from pushy salespeople. A Blinds.com designer helped me pick the perfect style for free. And Blinds.com shipped free samples right to my door. You can DIY or book a pro like I did with just one click. Best of all, everything's covered with the Blinds.com 100% satisfaction guarantee. Shop Blinds.com for up to 45% off. Rules and restrictions may apply. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Foam Face asks, short but simple, best operation name of the war. Got to be Gamora, hasn't it? You see, I think what's really interesting about G- G- uh, um, Gamora is, um, you know, there's the whole thing where, uh, around the D-Day thing where Churchill's sort of saying, I don't want um, a- any of my men killed in Operation Jellyfish. Or he's called like Jelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not going to happen on my, you know, dad. no man must give his life. Blah, blah, blah. And all that. Gamora. Gamora. That's, that's, that's kind of, but you know, modern American operation names are kind of like Operation Divine Justice of Vengeance or whatever. Or, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, or Righteous More or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, uh, with apologies to our American listeners, but, but, you know, British, British military op- operations these days tend to be, these days sort of tend to be Operation Grouting or Operation. <laughs> Biting, but, well, bite. Well, no, bite, well, biting's Bruneval, isn't it? But at least that's yeah, I know. But no, I still think that just doesn't sound right for an grapple, thing. grab, grapple, Granby, <laughs> grapple. Granby, yeah, Granby and Herrick and stuff, it's Herrick awful. and all that, rather than you know, divine shield of Almighty Justice. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, but 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 Gamora is is that's very interesting, isn't it? Because because I mean, let's just say Gamora had gone wrong and they hadn't caused a fire firestorm, then it's a bit of a silly name for it, isn't it? You know, it did go right. So, <laughs> I, know, I, know, so I, I mean, I think there's lots of really good names. I mean, Retribution's good, isn't it? I read um, Rob Hutton's book about Dudley Clark recently. Um, I really like um, Cascade, the, the, Cl- the Clark's yeah, name for his like a- disinformation campaign, because that's, yes, that's what it is. It's, it's a, you know, it, it's yes. it, it's good to have an operational name that tells you, I mean, without giving the game away, tells you what's going on. You know, it's a cascade yes. of information that, that the enemy's yes. cascaded with and he can't work out what's true and what isn't. And I, I, I like, I like there's another there's another Daddy Clark one, which is I just like Operation Animals. Yeah, that's that's really I've good. always liked that one. That's, that's the really, one in really Greece, good. you know, where they did forty two yeah, yeah. operations in a couple of months, yeah. and they prior to yeah. prior to Husky. Operation Animals is just a it's, it's one of my favourite ones of all. Right, it's it's well, just we'll a really on. good name. Yeah. Well, let's go Animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then. Right, animals, animals of Cascade. Animals. We're going to animals, I think. We're going to Operation Animals. I just think it's a great um, name. It is. It's brilliant. Now, Matty Palmer, though, asks, how does a soldier get awarded a VC, aside from doing something incredibly brave and amazing in the Second World War? What's the process involved? Well, first of all, it has to have been seen. <laughs> yes, that's the it biggest It has to have been problem. witnessed. Because after all, I mean, th- there must have been all, all sorts of people who've got up to a gun pit and and killed all five Germans in it and then being killed themselves. And no one knows about it because all the people with him also cut down, you know, or it happens, noises off. It happens sort of off stage, as it were. I mean, that's the first, that's the very first part of it. It has to be seen, generally has to be seen by an officer, doesn't it, as well? So it's... Yes. Uh- Witnessing yes, is and obviously, really, really inevitably what happens is lots more people get, uh, get, get put forward for VCs and actually are, are awarded. Yep. It tends to go from, you know, sort of battalion commander or whatever up to, up yep. to brigadier division and it goes uh, and a vc goes all the way to the top um and then it has to be signed off by you know monty in the case of 21st army group yeah. northwest europe it, it goes right to the top or you know if it's 1942 it'd go all the way up to, to, to alexander as cnc in middle east or or, or whatever it, yeah. it's right to the top and it has to be so obviously not a more than a dso yeah that that it's it, it's got to be, and actually, it's really interesting with the with the Paddy Main ones because he famously gets what it, what it is four yeah. DSOs and, and and never quite gets the VC. You could argue with Paddy Main that that he ha- he should he deserves an accumulative VC, which is what various of the airmen get. Yeah, um, it's what Leonard Cheshire gets, for example. But not one of his one of his 
actions for which he gets a DSO is probably worthy of a VC in its right, yeah, yeah, yeah. own right. That's the thing. The, the, the point about a VC is you have to be saving lots of other men's lives by unbelievably reckless yeah. regard for your own safety. Total disregard for your personal safety. It's total, total disregard, disregard isn't it? Isn't it? Total That's disregard. The, yeah, yeah. And, and so the vast majority of them are never to be posthumous because the total yeah. disregard bit is the kind of rub in the whole thing. But 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 that's how you get it, and and most of them get most of the recommendations get shoved down to DSO or even yeah. MC, Military yeah. Cross. Yeah, um, but that's how it works. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? Because at Rock's Drift, for instance, and I know it's not the second one. Yeah, but early days, they dole them out, right? And you te- they tend they or they can sometimes it's sort of you know iron like filings to. If there's been a disaster, yeah. sometimes that, that, that suddenly there's a sort there's a of bit of that going on with with Market Garden, isn't there? Oh God, what well, five VCs for one action? I, yeah, I think that's entirely what's going on. Not which is not to say that any of the people that receive their VCs um, that that it's not a don't deserve not, them. They don't deserve them. I mean, that's quite the opposite. I mean, I, you know, you can think of ten people uh, uh, um, in Market Garden who should have got them when you when you start to get into it. Jeffrey Powell, who's um, a company commander in One Five Six Para, when David Lord's plane goes down on the Tuesday afternoon, like at eight minutes past three or whatever, in flames on the supply drop, he turns to the bloke next to him and says, "That bugger got a VC." And he does get a VC. And there, uh, there's a there's an awful around Market Garden before it. There's an awful lot of VC chat. They're all joking about it, you know. When the comet plan comes up, um, th- there's you know th- th- this one's going to get you a wooden cross or a Victoria cross. This this operation, you know, uh, and, and there is a there's a sort of because they're such gung ho people. There's a culture. There's a culture of, of you know they're talking about it all the time. But then you also suspect that there's a there's a lot of banter about it, you know, as well. But that yeah, yeah. I mean when there's a when there is when there's a disaster. You know, because I always think it's it's interesting. There's only one on D-Day. You know, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. And you think also that sort of you know David Render and Sherwood Rangers doesn't get an MC. Yeah. He doesn't get an MC despite repeatedly putting his life in you know, unspeakable danger over yeah. and over and over and over again. And but does it, I mean, would it be be him saying to to Stanley Christopherson, please don't write me up? I mean, you know, no, no he was really he was pissed off about it. <laughs> okay, fine. He was pissed off about it. You know, he kind of, you know, he was. He'd much rather be alive and not have an MC than have an MC and be dead. But, yeah. but, but <laughs> he felt his survival. Done his, it done it. Yeah. Worked against him on the Ghana Gong front, yeah. and he was a little bit sore about it because other people had got MCs for less than he had done, and that, right, that was right, absolutely right. the case. I mean, you know, right. he was not wrong in that at all. You, you know, it is a lottery and everyone knows it's a lottery and, and yeah. no one gets a gong who does, you know, very, very few people get gongs who don't deserve them. Well, this is but it. There's a lot this of people who it. do deserve them but don't get them. Get I think them. that's the point. So yeah. so it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's, it's an unfair system, but it's not, it's not that unfair. And also there is this whole thing about, you know, when you get a when you get a DSO or an MC or a VC or whatever, it's it's not the VC is different. That is all about the individual. But but yeah. but other gongs, they're kind of representative of a of a unit or a yeah. whatever. You know, there's there's a kind of allocation that you can't have too many people with MCs, for example, yeah. in any one battalion, um, etc. So I it, mean, it's that, kind that of quotas on a, on bravery are like I mean, it's a, that, in a way no, that's, no, that's absurd, isn't it? It's a crazy, completely crazy, yeah. and also how. Yeah. You know, how's that going to encourage anyone <laughs> to be brave? Right. I mean, it, it's not it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a kind of you know it's a, it's a it's a guideline rule. So yeah. you know, there's 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 a lot going on with with gongs and stuff. But I mean, you know, it's the same anywhere, same now. Why you know why why does someone today get an MBE and someone else not? Yeah. You know, there's lots of people who do amazing things for charity. You don't get anything. Yeah, yeah. There's one more that I want to ask from Brian Williams. The Italian campaign saw serious problems of desertion and indiscipline in the British and US armies. Was there any consideration for the greater use of the death penalty? Yeah, there was actually, and and Alexander suggested it. He said, (gasps) you know, he said he didn't want to use it. He said he didn't want to use it. He just wanted it to be there. Um, He said, you know, you might make one example of someone, but he said it's so bad that how are we going to stop this otherwise? Wow. Yep. Yeah. Wow, hmm. that's interesting. And what what persuaded him not to start shooting people? Uh, no, he he wasn't dissuaded. Um, 
uh, Jumbo <laughs> Wilson was and um, people further up the chain. Because Adam definitely looked at it at one point, but, but um, uh, as adjutant general, but but and his attitude, as well. yeah, but Orkinac his attitude, uh, Ad, yeah, Ad, Adam's attitude was to explore all options was his was his sort of um, methodology. So you could I could sort of see why he would have looked at it, but I mean it's very interesting that in theatre that it's being considered. I mean, yeah, the, Brit- the British Army don't shoot anyone um, or any of their own people, um, uh, do they? But but. I mean, did it make you feel differently about Alex reading that for discovering that? Well, yeah, you know, a little bit. I mean, you kind of think, oh, come on. Um, but but I, you know, but I can also can see see you know he's got a, he's got a point, hasn't he? I mean, desertion to General Sir H. Maitland Wilson right. from General the Honourable Sir Harold Alexander. The problem of desertion is a very serious one, and I wish to ask for your personal assistance in dealing with it. It is not, of course, a new problem, but periods of severe fighting, such as the present, bring it to the fore. To show you how serious it is, I might mention that at this very time, there are 450 men awaiting trial in Naples for desertion or absence without leave. These come from three divisions only. Every day, 25 men are being brought in by the military police in Naples, and it is proving difficult to try cases as fast as new ones arise. The fact is that the punishment awarded by courts martial is inadequate. A sentence of penal servitude is ineffective, firstly, because the man knows that it is likely to be suspended after he has served a short term. Secondly, because he counts on a general amnesty at the end of the war. The abolition of the death penalty for desertion has undoubtedly been a great mistake. I have repeatedly emphasised this. I am convinced that this penalty should be reintroduced. If the government is still unwilling to take this step, I urge that at least firm action should be taken to dissipate the prevalent idea that men who shamefully abandon their comrades in action will be allowed full enjoyment of the victory when it is won. It is unfair to the men who stay to fight without the aid of their disloyal comrade. It is unfair to the man himself. Most of these deserters are not bad men. Many of them have fought well. They would not have disgraced themselves if they had had moral stiffening, which the prospect of adequate punishment would provide. Yeah. Okay, just just let's remember this is 1944, not yeah 2024. But you know, it's Blimey. pretty hard hitting stuff. Obviously, it is. And, yeah, Blimey. But 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 you know, you've, you you know, there is a the worry is that the whole thing disintegrates. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were talking with this John when we were with John McManus the other day about the problems in Italy. Too much is being expected of yeah. of the infantrymen. No one is going to be executed because they're at their wits' end. You know, yeah, that yeah. is not going to happen. Yeah. That's not what he's suggesting. There's not going to be a kind of sort of, you know, Michael Morpurgo shot at dawn, poor Jimmy, he was only 16 yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. That isn't going to happen. You know, this is for serial malingerers who are just not the, pulling their weight. But, but, but that, that's a really interesting point, though, Jim, because, you know, it, it, that's the... A, a, a huge tonal shift since the f- f- First World War. They shoot 300 people, the British Army. The yeah, first something World like War. that. Yeah, yeah, 300, yeah. something like that. But there's, but there's, isn't it? Th- there's a shift that the basically, uh, you know, it's got to be serial malingers that they're, 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 they know in the end they're never going to be able to define who the actual, who they actually have to shoot. That's the problem, isn't it? In the end, you're never ever going to be able to, not quite. And and will it work anyway? I think is the, I think that's the other. Will will executing people work? Probably not, because people will think, well, I'll be I could be killed at the front anyway. What difference does it make? Yeah, I think I think his point is if you know that you're you know if you desert, all you're going to be doing is letting down your mates, but you're going to basically yeah. get away with it. Yeah. Um. You, you know, you might say, well, I'll be in prison for four years, but at least I'll be alive in four years' time. Whereas, yeah, you know, I'll probably get killed next Tuesday. But if yeah. you know there's a chance that you might get put before a firing squad, that's quite. Mm. A, it's it's not just the death; it's a shame. It's a kind of the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a you know there's a, that, that's that's quite a big big barrier, and and, and there's some further correspondence about it in which he says, look, I'm not I'm not suggesting. Yeah, I'm suggesting we do do this on a very, very extreme and rare case. Yeah. But but poor then it's there. Les o- poor on Courage Les Outre, as it were. It's, yes, it, it's Admiral Bing, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it is where you end where you end up. It, it, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's amazing because the Americans, you know, they they, they do shoot someone. Um, I mean, they, they, the Americans execute people for rape and murder, don't they? But they do execute a deserter. Um, uh, yeah, one, but he's a murderer, isn't it? There's only one one yeah. guy in the whole war yeah. who's executed for desertion, but he is also a murderer. So, yeah. uh, you know, and a proper scallywag. 
obviously I find the whole thing kind of repellent because yeah, the idea disgusting. that anyone has the right to take the life of anybody, I think is, is you know, is really problematic. Yeah. Um, you know, one has to kind of try and put oneself in the shoes of those in charge. And, you know, it is a massive, massive problem. And, and you know, the problem in Italy is, is that too much is being expected. You know, yeah. too much is being expected of the commanders, frankly, of Alexander yeah, yeah. and Clark and, and you know, et al. And too much is being expected of, of, of a theatre which is not being properly surprised. You know, this is this has always been my kind of big point about the Italian campaign. So what do you do? You, you know, you, you've been given an unbelievably tough hand. It doesn't get through, it doesn't get passed, and it doesn't happen. And the desertions continue, and it continues to be an absolute problem, increasingly so after June 1944, actually. I mean, once they got to Rome, everyone really then thinks, okay, we've got to Rome now. You know, that was the objective. Why, why, why are we still doing this? You know, if this is a secondary theatre, what's the point? And, you know, they've got a point. Um, so it just gets worse and worse and worse, to be perfectly honest. Um, but, you know, if you're... You know, people are executed, don't forget, for, for, for murder and for rape and stuff. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's all still going on. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's a question like of desertion. And, it, it, yeah, I mean, after all, the, the, this is a this is a, a an option that the, the enemy can resort to um, quite comfortably, is the thing, offing people. Um, and, in fact, yeah. and, in fact, and, in fact, one of your allies. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and Italians, people who are caught spying for the, for the acts, you know, for Germany, they're also executed, just as Italians caught sabotaging, the, yeah. you know, on behalf of the Allies for the uh, against the Germans are also executed. I mean, yeah, 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 right. Well, we hope we've answered that, Brian. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I think Jim, you've you've struggled with that very well. That that Alexander should do something like that, and I think I think you're coping with it well. And um, <laughs> oh, no, it's quite hard. I've, I've been I've been having a couple no, of hits you- recently. <laughs> I've been mean, having a couple of hits recently, you know, sort of slightly dented. I still think he was amazing. He's still my favourite general, but. You know, I don't mean to do this to you, but, you know. I know, but he backs Freiburg. That casino, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. that, that's hard to square. Okay. Well, um, I think I think we, we've uh, we've we've covered a few of those questions. And we'll, we'll be endeavouring to um, answer with a few more. Um, James and I, um, yesterday, we were talking about um, stuff, stuff on the podcast we've enjoyed doing. And I think it might be worth revisiting family stories at some point, don't you? Yeah, I think so. I think it's nice. I, li- I, li- I, like, I like hearing those stories. And it's also a reminder, isn't it, that the Second World War is fundamentally about the ordinary man yeah. and woman so we've, caught so up in these gonna... extraordinary affairs. So if, if people want to kind of send in their stories again, please do, because let's try and get another yeah. series up and running. So email your family stories to wehavewayspodcast at gmail.com. And I want the words family stories in capitals, or we won't accept them. I also, uh, for the old school listener, I will admit that using email is for old people. And uh, so we're expecting <laughs> emails from old people only, whereas da kids can send them to us on TikTok or something. I don't know. I, I, I don't know that this podcast has a TikTok presence, and that's the way we're keeping it. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. Uh, that was a great chat, Jim. Thanks. It's always it's always good to sort of chew chew round the cud and end up small picture, big picture in the middle picture, and then seeing James Holland's face on this screen cope so manfully with his disappointment in um, Harold Alexander is a treat that, <laughs> it's a treat that I get to enjoy and you get to listen to anyway we'll see all you very soon cheerio cheerio hello Saul David and Patrick Bishop here from the Battleground podcast We wanted to give you all a heads up on what we've been up to on Battleground and the exciting places we're taking it. Each Friday, we bring listeners a weekly insight into events in Ukraine based on our joint expertise as historians and my experience as a war reporter, supplemented by frontline coverage from contributors in the field, as in the latest episode marking the second anniversary of the full-blown Russian invasion, which features a brilliant frontline dispatch from journalist Askel Krushelnitsky. But that's not all. Midweek since the start of the year, we've been delving back into the dramatic and epoch-making events of 80 years ago in Battleground 44. A fresh take on the battles, personalities, themes and controversies of this crucial period in World War II. This week, we're looking at the French Resistance, with episodes on the Eastern Front, The Great Escape and much, much more to come, aided by input from some of the great historians of our age. So if you want to hear truly informed and insightful news and analysis on the war in Ukraine, as well as our gripping Battleground 44 series, just search Battleground on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.